Good morning, everybody. You know, it's really neat when you get to preach and you know what you're going to preach is the Word of God because He gave it to you. And excuse me a minute, Ma. There we go. Mike didn't want to get on. Now, I want to warn you ahead of time that this is a dangerous sermon. It's one of those sermons that is so important, but when you hear it, you're going to think one of two things. You're going to turn your ears off because you're going to say, I've already heard that. Or it's going to be so profound to you that you're going to say, it's too good to be true. It can't be about me. So... Open up your heart. We're going to pray for God to open our hearts and our ears to hear this message. Me too. You know, I had the fun of letting God give me this message. But whenever he gives somebody a message, it's for them. You know, I needed this message so much. So, Father, I just want to thank you so much that this is your word about us. Who we are is good. It is your declaration over us. It is constant, it is secure, and it never changes. I ask that you would open up our ears and our hearts so that not only can we hear what you're saying, but we will let it impact our hearts at a deep level, the level that you want to impact our hearts so that we will know the length and depth and height and breadth of your love for us and be filled up with the fullness of God. Thank you, Father. Sometimes it is difficult to uh, hear a message that you say, I've already heard that. There's probably nothing in it for me. But in Philippians 3.1, Paul said that it wasn't a grievous thing to him to write the same things over and over and he said there was a reason that it wasn't grievous to him. And it was because it was for the people's safety. He said the same things to them over and over again for their safety. And that word safety means security, safety, and surety. So what God wants to do is he wants to put a word in us, in our hearts, that comes from him that gives us safety. It's a word that needs to be repeated over and over and over again. And a little bit later, I'll talk about why. But when we live in a world that's constantly telling us something opposite, God wants to be sure that we're always hearing from his heart above everything else. There was a popular comedian. I'm going to show my age. There was a popular comedian um, in the 70s named Flip Wilson. One of his sayings was, the devil made me do it. And he'd talk about something that he did wrong, a, a, a wrong behavior, and he'd say, the devil made me do it. And everybody would laugh. It was a big joke. But what he was making fun of was a severe plight that has attacked humanity. The need to find personal justification by blaming someone else for our mistakes or our negative feelings. And we talked about this a lot in the Bible study this morning, which is so awesome. It's such a confirmation to me that this is exactly what God wanted preached. Now, justification has several different meanings, and Greg has gone through them all probably in the last year. The, the, um, the definition that I want to use is to show as just or innocent. Very big difference. Not to make one innocent, to show that they already are innocent and blameless. Why is there such a strong need for justification within the human heart? Why will we go to such lengths to try to justify ourselves? 
It's because God created us to be just like him. We are supposed to live in his innocence, in his word about us, and in his justification. You were made innocent. You were made innocent. And when you did something wrong, a wrong behavior, you didn't lose your innocence. You're still just like God. So innocence is the essence of who you are as a person. Who you are is good. I am going to say that over and over and over this morning. Who you are is good. Because you need to hear it over and over and over. Because so many other people have told you that you're not. Even yourself has told yourself that you're not. Our hearts were created to live out of what God says about us. We see this as a bedrock of our very being in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, it says, So God created man in his own image. Doesn't that say something right there? Whose image did he make you in? His. Can that be anything but good? Of course not. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now the part of this that I want to focus on is the word blessed. A lot of us know this already, but we need to hear it again. And a lot of us have heard it maybe once or twice and have forgotten it. Some of us maybe have never heard it before. This word blessed didn't mean that God wanted to do something nice for them. It was that God knelt down on one knee and adored Adam and Eve. Now, can you imagine that God would have done that if there was one speck of not good in them? Of course not. God is saying, these people are just like me. They're cut from the same rock, just like you and I are. Why was this the first thing that Adam saw when he woke up? Can you imagine having that as your foundation? The first thing you see that you're aware of when you open your eyes is the creator of the universe bow down on one knee adoring you? That happened because that was to be their foundation. That was the place that they were to know who they were. That was the place that they were supposed to live their lives from. Adam's heart was created to live out of the faith of the Son of God. Then God's life would flow through him effortlessly as he believed the truth about himself. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 to 23, it says, My son, attend to my words. Incline thy ear unto my sayings. Now, I've read this scripture for 30 years. I can quote it in and out. I can quote it from several different versions of the Bible, and I still misinterpreted it. I thought it meant for 35 years to, you better listen to what God's saying about what you have to do and what you have to not do in order to please him. That's not what the words and the sayings are that this is talking about. It's the words that God spoke about man. The words that God spoke about you. And he says, those words, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them. And health to all their flesh. The words are who you are is good. Those words bring you God's life. It brings health to your body. It brings peace to your soul. It lets you be at rest with who you are and who God is. 
for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So God is saying here, I have spoken something over you that is the truth. It's the only truth for you to believe. It's that who you are is good because that's who I created you to be. Don't let those words depart from your eyes or your heart. Keep them before you all the time. Don't let what anybody else says move you from what God says about you. For out of those words being in your heart, that's where your life is going to flow out of. Now, I dare say there's not one person in this room that can sit here truthfully and say, I haven't had a bad thought about myself this past week. Wow. And hey, I'm being real generous. <laughs> then we could make it probably today. There is such an effortless ability for us to look at ourselves and see ourselves through our failures, through what we haven't done right. That's the problem. That's not what we're supposed to be looking at. We're supposed to be looking at what God says about us. If we look at what God says about us and we forget about all of our actions, God's life will flow through us. And you don't ever have to worry about a bad action again. Because if you've got God's life flowing through you, do you think there's going to be any bad actions? Of course not. It'll just be God. So the words that are planted in your heart are where your life is going to flow from. So the words that you hear and absorb in your heart are very important. It doesn't matter whether it comes from your boss, your family, your friends, or yourself. If the words are negative, it is damaging your heart. It's hurting the life that God wants to have flowing out of you. In Proverbs chapter 4, verses 24 through 27, it says, Put away from thee a froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy feet from evil. This word froward means distorted, false, crooked. Anything that disagrees with what God says. Anything that disagrees with God says you want to put that mouth, that accusation away from you. Even if it's yourself. Sometimes I just have to go, I can be my own worst enemy. Because it's so easy to get focused on our behavior instead of what God says about us. Now it says here, oh, I want to talk about this word perverse too. Perverse means contrary to the accepted or expected standard or practice. Wow. The expected standard is God's standard. We all thought God's standard was way up here and we were way down here. God's standard puts us right there with him right smack in the Godhead, equal in character to God, how hard that is for us to believe. That's why we need God to persuade our hearts. God, persuade my heart that I am just like you. Persuade my heart. Keep speaking the truth to me. So anything that's contrary to the original words that God spoke over mankind is perverse. Anything that doesn't line up with God getting down on one knee and adoring you is contrary to what should be in your heart and what you should be letting go through your mind about yourself. Now let's look at that, let all thy ways be established. Established in what? 
Isaiah 54, 14 tells us, In righteousness shalt thou be established. Did you hear that? In righteousness you will be established. And when you're established in righteousness, you will be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. That is an amazing scripture. God is saying that when we get established in who we really are and who God says we are, fear leaves. How many of us have lived our lives in fear? Still living our lives in fear. Fear of not being accepted. Fear of the future. Fear of the past. Fear of right now. It means that we haven't totally let God persuade our hearts of who we are in him. Adam and Eve were established in righteousness at the beginning. They were given the faith of the Son of God in what God said about them and how he treated them. But they got sidetracked. They did look to the left or the right. Let's face it. You're going to hear a lot of things coming from the left to the right. You're going to hear it all the time. Voices are going to come at you saying, you did that wrong. Many times they're going to come right from within yourself. That's the time where you say, no, I'm not listening to that perverse mouth. I'm going to keep my eyes focused and my heart focused on what God says about me. God says, I am good. Period. That's it. Nothing else, nothing more. But Adam and Eve listened to the lies of the devil, and they became established in the words of the serpent. The serpent said, you are not like God, but you can become like God. By what? By believing what God said? No. He told them they could become like God because of what they did. Did. There's the lie. And right there began the need for mankind to seek to justify themselves by any other means than the truth that God said about us. Proverbs 4.27, I'm going to read that last verse again. It says, turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Again, 30, 40 years. I believe that meant you've got to watch what you do. You've got to do everything just right. That's not what this evil is talking about. It's not talking about your actions. It's talking about believing Satan's lies about you. That is the evil that you want to stay away from. It sounds like this. It'll be real familiar to you. You are not like God. Why can't you get everything right? Why can't you get anything right? Who you are is not good. If I could just be somebody else, if I could just be like this person, if I was just prettier, if I was just thinner, if I was just younger, if I was just more educated, it goes on and on and on. We've all heard it. Now, I'm going to give you Proverbs chapter 4, verses 24 through 27, which is what we just read. I'm going to give you the DLT, Denise's Literal Translation. Don't listen to any words that tell you that you are not like God. Don't let any words other than the faith of the Son of God impact your heart. Don't let anything you see sway you from that truth. Don't let anything you see tell you that you are not good and you must try to become good. Stay established in God's persuasion about you. You are already righteous. You are already good. You are already innocent. If you find yourself walking in Satan's belief system, that tells you that you are not good, but you can become good if you just try hard enough, run. Run away from it 
get away from it. <clears throat> Two of the, the definitions for that word remove means to rebel or revolt. God wants us to get drenched in who he says we are. Drenched, saturated, so that nothing else can come in and impact you. <clears throat> in Genesis 3-7, we're going to look at what happened to Eve when they believed that they were not good. <clears throat> and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. <clears throat> I want you to think about that for a second. God gave them his righteousness, his innocence. He got down on one knee and adored them. And they got fig leaves to take that place. Does that even make sense? Here you can have a few fig leaves or you can have the glory of God and know that you are the same in character as God. Anybody here want some fig leaves? No. We look at that and we say that's so ridiculous. Yet, we do the same thing. We don't go out and get fig leaves. No, we're a whole lot more sophisticated. We use our schooling. We use our titles. We might use promotions. And we try to cover ourselves and say, look, that made me good. And we think that that is better than what God gave us. It's just as silly as the fig leaves. But because our need for justification is so strong, and because we've had so many voices coming at us saying, it's all based on your behavior, or it's based on what has happened to you, or it's based on what you have, that we think we have to go get ourselves some fancy fig leaves and cover ourselves. When all the time God is saying, you already have my innocence. You can't be any better if you tried. You are just like me. Now, Adam and Eve ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They realized that they were naked, and they tried to clothe themselves with fig leaves. This was the first attempt of mankind to justify themselves. It's called a cover-up. That is what happens when inside of us we think we're bad. We have to cover it up. We have to cover it up so other people don't know what we know about ourselves. I know. I live there. I'm still not 100% out of it, but I'm getting there. We don't have to cover up anything. When we're covering up ourselves, we're covering up the glory of God because that's who we are. In Genesis 3, 8, it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So even though they tried to clothe themselves, they still knew they were naked. And we know that because they still hid. Isn't it just that way with us? Have you found anything that you can do that clothes yourself permanently? No. There isn't anything you can do. That's the whole point. You're not supposed to do anything to produce your glory and your honor and your value. God already did that for you. So what happens is we go on that same slippery slope that Adam and Eve were on. You try a few fig leaves. And that doesn't get it. So then you go do something more. And you try that. You still know inside there's something wrong. And you do more. And you do more. And you find that you're living in performance. Performance produces one thing. And I'll tell you by experience. It produces self-hatred. It produces self-hatred. Because no matter how hard you try, and no matter how hard you work, and no matter how long you try to perform, you cannot cover it up. It will never work. 
You were never meant to be covered up. You were meant to shine because you are just like God. And when you believe that fully, there's no more need to try to cover up anything. Now, we just read in Isaiah 54, 14, that when we're established in righteousness, we won't have any fear. So let's go back and look at Adam and Eve. The Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Now we know he's not established in righteousness because he wouldn't have been able to be afraid. And he says, Because I was naked and I hid myself. So here we see the first time man's need to hide from God even though man is still perfect, he is still just like God. He hasn't changed. Man, we've got to realize that. They didn't change. The only thing that changed was what they believed. That's it. If I decided today to believe that I'm Larry, would anybody here believe that? Of course you wouldn't. But if I believed it, it would change how I did everything. Well, I would go in the closet and I would be putting on his shirts and, and his pants and I'd be going and getting on that lawnmower and, and cutting the grass and doing all the things that he did. But you know what? No matter how many times I cut the grass, no matter how many times I put on his clothes, I am still Denise, right? Right. right. <laughs> the same thing with Adam and Eve. Same thing with us. We are already just like God. Who you are is already good. You've just forgotten who you are. You believe lies about yourself. Adam and Eve began to fear in the sight of God. They were no longer resting in who they were. They rejected what God said about them, and they tried to get their own goodness by what they did, and that brought them fear. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, it says, And God said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman that you gave to me to be with me. She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Oh, wow. This is the first time we see man going, it's their fault. Because man was meant to live out of the justification in their heart. If Adam or Eve thought that she lost it, or Adam thought that he lost it, he had to find a way to put the blame on somebody else so he could still live out of his own justification. We were created to live out of this justification. Our heart knows it. Just like we talked about in the Bible study today. There's something in us that says, I am supposed to be justified. I am supposed to be justified. I am supposed to be justified. If you don't believe that who you are is already good, you are doomed to live your life trying to get it for yourself. And you will have to blame others. Just like Adam had to blame Eve. And hey, he blamed God for giving him Eve also. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. This is the first time we hear the devil made me do it. Flip Wilson did not make up that line. It came straight out of the garden. The devil made me do it. And for those of us that were in the Bible study this morning, Greg said something so profound. There is nothing that's happened to us in our lives Nothing that anybody has done to us that can hurt us. 
Wow, man, you need to just ponder on that for a really long time. Because, I mean, when he said it, I'm sitting there thinking, uh, no, uh, I remember so-and-so did this, and so-and-so did that, and it sure hurt my feelings. No, they didn't cause the hurt. What caused the hurt was a lie in your own heart that you already believe about yourself. Otherwise, what they say can't touch you. That is how powerful this is. The truth that who you are is good. It will make it so that nothing can touch you. Nothing can hurt you. Our hearts were created to live out of this truth that who you are is good. It's living out of what God says about you. We were made to be established in what God says about us. If we are not established in those truths, those vital principles, our hearts are going to start trying to create all kind of ways to justify ourselves, just like Adam and Eve did. We'll blame other people. We'll hide the truth that we believe about ourselves. We'll try to do all kind of things to try to get justification for ourselves. Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Notice what the weapons that are formed against us are. Words that condemn us. Words that judge us to be different than what God says about us. That's the weapons. It's not temptations to do something wrong. It's the words that you're hearing about yourself. Those are the weapons that are going to come at you. And what does it say? When a weapon comes at you that disagrees with what God says, if you hear something that's anything other than who you are is good, you're supposed to condemn that thing. No, that is a lie. That's our heritage. Our righteousness comes from God. We don't have to work it up. Our hearts were not made for judgment against us. Like Greg said this morning, Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. The reason we're brokenhearted is because we have believed lies about ourselves. And it broke our hearts. It set us about on a lifelong journey of failure where we tried to make ourselves be as righteous as God is by our own efforts. That's as dumb as the fig leaf. It just won't get it. Instead of accepting the lies that come to us, we need to guard our hearts by declaring anything that disagrees with God's opinion of us as a lie. We don't have to justify ourselves by blaming someone or by anything that we do. It's just accepting what God has said about you. It's so simple. Can you accept what God has said about you? He says who you are is good. you got choices to make. You can believe what God says, who, by the way, created the whole universe. I mean, he's kind of smart. It says he can't lie, so he's got to be the one that has the truth. He says that who you are is good. The challenge is, are we going to keep our eyes only on that, or are we going to look at our actions? Are we going to look at where we live? Are we going to look at the job that we have? You have to take your eyes off of something to put it on something else. The serpent got Eve to go and look at that tree and made her think that it was good, or he tempted her to think it was good. If she would have kept her eyes on what God said about her, she wouldn't have needed to go look at that tree. There was no need to do that. When we are seeing ourselves needing to justify ourselves, and we do it all the time, I know I do, 
It just means that I haven't yet totally accepted what God says about me. And that's okay. Because God promises to persuade our hearts. It's the thing that he loves to do the most. He was telling you all the time how good you are, how perfect you are, how you're just like him. And you might say, well, I don't hear that. Yeah, you're hearing it right now. And I'm not the one that came up with this sermon. I can promise you. This is God. He might be speaking through me, but it's God. And this is what he's saying to you. You don't have to justify yourself. God's already done it. He's created you just like him. What more could you want? Proverbs 3.3 3 says, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Here we go again. God is saying, this is really important. This is a big deal. Don't let go of it. Let me persuade your heart of who you are, and don't let anything else move you off of that truth. Mercy means to be kind, and the truth is the faith of the Son of God. I'm going to go over a small part of the, faith of, Son of, of the faith of the Son of God because we all need to hear it daily, right? <laughs> the faith of the Son of God says, God is at rest with who you are as his son and daughter. He's not trying to change you. He likes you. He made you. Who you are is good. God has no desire to add something to you for you to be acceptable to him. God will always visit you with his goodness and loving kindness and favor. He is well pleased with you because who you are is good. You are full of God's glory and honor. Your value and worth is equal to Jesus, seated at the right hand of God in heaven. You are innocent. God has never known you by what you do or don't do. I want you just for a second to let there be just a board, an eraser board in your heart. God has never looked at you based on what you do or don't do. Let yourself just let Jesus Come and just get that eraser and erase anything you're thinking in your heart. Any memories you have about what you did or didn't do, right or wrong. Let him take it away from you. He never sees you that way. And he doesn't want you to see yourself that way either. God has always known you as you really are. According to the Spirit seated in the Godhead. In Galatians 2.20, Paul said that he lived his life by those things. Pretty amazing. He said, I live my life by the faith of the Son of God. Before Paul accepted Jesus, he was steeped in tradition and law and what he could do. And he found out that it was worthless. In fact, how worthless was it? Dung. Who wants a big serving of that on their table? That's what our performance is. And let me tell you, Paul did better than any of us could have. I mean, he was up there. He tried to perform everything just right. In fact, it says he was a Pharisee among the Pharisees. He was the top, the cream of the crop. And all that stuff that he accomplished, he called it dung. It's the same for us. It will not help us. In fact, it will break our hearts. Proverbs 4.20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thy ear unto my sayings. Now remember I said that those words and sayings are the faith of the Son of God. That's all that that's talking about. In Galatians 2.16 we're told that knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, 
but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So it doesn't matter how hard you try. Doesn't matter how long you try. Doesn't matter how good you try. You will never be justified by what you do. It can't happen. You're justified by the faith of the Son of God, and you've already got it. It's a done deal. God's good view and opinion of you is your justification. There is nothing better. Why is this so important? It's because it's the essence of your identity. It's who you are. It's what you're supposed to live out of. It's what the devil succeeded in stealing from mankind. Not our goodness. He couldn't take that, but he could take away our belief that we were good. That's what he took. Remember the cat that Greg talked about? He had a friend when he was a teenager, and they had a lot of cats all the time. And all of a sudden, one of the new kittens in the litter wasn't there anymore, and they couldn't find it. And a while later, they saw this strange animal in the yard, and it was all messed up like that. You know how cats groom themselves. Well, this thing had dreadlocks, and it was just a mess. And they realized that it was being taken care of by a family of raccoons. That cat thought it was a raccoon. So it lived with the raccoons, and it acted like raccoons. But guess what? It was still a cat. But the sad thing is, because it believed it was a raccoon, it didn't get the relationship that it was supposed to have with its mom and the other cats in the neighborhood. It distanced itself from them and went with the raccoons. The same thing happens to us with God. When we don't know who we really are, that we're just like God, it messes up our relationship with him. We begin to think that our relationship is all about what we do and what we need to do to please him, when all he wants to do is love you because he enjoys who you are. See, he knows who you are is good. There aren't any lying words that can come to God and tell him anything different about you. He knows who you are. So he wants to be able to have that relationship with you that he always wanted, where there's no fear, where there's no guilt, where there's no shame. Again, I encourage you, if you haven't done it already this morning, let God go into your heart and erase Everything that you've ever judged yourself for what you did or you didn't do. And ask God to show you who you are. Our hearts have been programmed to live out of justification because that's how God lives. God lives by faith and in truth. And he created us just like him. So we're supposed to live out of that justification also. The problem is, is that we started getting our justification from what we did instead of how God made us. This is what happens when we're justified by what God says about us. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. Peace with God. No need for fig leaves. No need to hide. No need to feel naked. Just to know that your Heavenly Father adores you and He loves being with you. Romans 8, 29 through 30, it says, For whom He foreknew, He also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, 
them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. This is a done deal. In Ephesians 4, 1, it says this happened and God saw it before the foundation of the world, before he created the world, before he created us. He saw in his heart who we were, and we were blameless in his sight. Now, there are two belief systems, and we're usually believing both of them at the same time in different areas, and we just don't realize it. But you can believe God's belief system that says who you are is good, or you can believe the devil's belief system that says you have to try to become good by your self-effort to do everything right. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Whoa, that's where the problem starts. If you think you are not like God, you believe you're not like God. If you believe you're not like God, the fruit and actions in your life are going to go that way. So simple. It's all just what we believe and nothing more. What did man lose in the garden? Did he lose his true identity? No. He lost the knowledge of his true identity. What did God restore to mankind when he was raised from the dead? His true identity? No. Just the knowledge of his true identity. Who we were never changed. It was just our belief system. Our hearts need to live out of this truth so they can be healed. When God gave me the sermon, at first I didn't think it was from him. I thought, everybody's heard this already. And then God reminded me about Shema Shema, that you have to hear and keep hearing. God never gets tired of telling you who you are. In fact, it's the faith that he lives by. And we should never get tired of hearing how wonderful we are and how much he adores us. And then God asked me an amazing question. He said, how many times a day do I eat food? And I said, as often as I can. <laughs> And he said, well, why do you do that over and over again? And I said, because I need food to stay alive. And he said, exactly. And he gave me this scripture, Matthew 4, 4. But Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is how we are to live. It gives us life. Hearing what God says about us over and over and over again. Not just on Sunday morning. Hey, we are really blessed that we can come to church every Sunday and we can hear over and over how God feels about us and never hear lies. But we need it. I can't eat just one meal a week. That isn't going to get it for me. We need to let God persuade our hearts over and over and over each day. We need to keep hearing what he says about us. Jeremiah 23, verses 28 through 29. This is in the Amplified Version. The prophet who has a dream, let him tell his dream. But he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat for nourishment, says the Lord. God's word is going to nourish you and give you life. The devil's words about you are going to kill you. You may not drop over dead, that's true, but the life that you're living will be a life where there's death, anxiety, fear, guilt, and shame. God's word and what he says about us brings us life. We need to hear it and live out of it all the time. And then it says, is not my word. Remember his word is what he says about you, that you are just like God. 
who you are is good. It consumes all that cannot endure the test. If you keep hearing and keep hearing, it will consume everything that's a lie in your heart. And like a hammer that breaks in pieces the rock of most stubborn resistance. You know, sometimes... You don't try to be stubborn, but if you lived your life for the majority of your years being told that you were stupid, being told that you were worthless, being told that you weren't lovable in some way or form, whether it was from your family or your friends or kids at school or from wherever, there is going to be a resistance in your heart that says, no, I'm not like God. I'm not good. Who I am isn't good. But if you let God's word and what he says about you continue to be like a hammer, it will go into your heart and it's going to break up those lies so that you can live out of the fullness of God. Isaiah 55 gives us that assurance also. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word about you be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. God's word about you has a purpose. There's a reason he wants to speak the truth over you again and again and again. He has a purpose. And you know what the purpose is? He wants to have a relationship with you. That is his purpose. You are so wonderful that he just wants to be with you. He doesn't want any walls between you and him. He doesn't want any guilt. He doesn't want any shame. He doesn't want any fear. He wants all the lies gone so that he can have that deep relationship with you that he wants. And the one that, let's face it, we want it also. Here comes the, what do you call it, the clinker. Proverbs 3.3 3 says, let not mercy, which is God's kindness in truth, the faith of the Son of God, what God says about you, let it not forsake thee. Bind that mercy and truth about yourself around your neck and write them on the table of your heart. That word forsake means don't let it be loosened. Don't let God's good opinion of you loosen. Okay, I looked up the word neck. Get ready. The word neck means the throat as used in rumination to bring up the cud like a cow eats nourishment or food, takes it down into its stomach or heart, brings it back up again, and chews on it more to get more nourishment, swallows it down, brings it back up. God is saying to take what he says about you. Take it in, hear it. Let it come up out of your heart over and over and over. Keep chewing on it. Don't say, yeah, I know God loves me. Because if that's your response, you really don't know God loves you. Not the way he wants you to. God is saying, continually, keep this in your heart, continually. And here's a picture of the process. Faith comes. Who God says you are. Who you are is good, is heard. It goes in your ears when you have ears to hear. It goes into your heart. It's his good view and opinion of you. Then it's brought up continually out of your heart. It's what you're going to live by. You're going to let it come up over and over and over again. 
You're going to hear it over and over again. You're going to let God continually persuade your heart and chew on it over and over and over so you can have God's life. When that's going on in our heart, we see Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. This is the relationship that God wants with you. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. He's going to dwell in your heart and have his way in your heart by his good opinion of you, that who you are is good, that you'll be rooted and grounded in love and may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth, passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. That is what God wants his word to accomplish in you. That you will know, not just in your heads, but by experience, the deepness and the love that God has for you to such an extent that you will become filled with God. How do you get rooted and grounded in that word? By hearing it over and over and over again. Let it come up out of your heart. Chew on it over and over and over. Who you are is good. There is no doubt about it. There is nothing that can change that truth. Nothing that you do, nothing that you don't do. Nothing that you believe or don't believe. Nothing can change the truth. But what can change is the relationship you can have with God and what kind of life you'll have with God here on this earth. That's what changes the belief system. And that's why God is so determined for us to know that who we are is good. So we'll have that fullness of life that he wants us to have. Can you imagine that you are free to be who you are? Just think about that. Ah, just for one second, just let go. Just take off all the ropes and the things that are binding you that says, I have to be this way, I have to be this way, I have to please this person, I have to be this way for this person. Just let go. It's okay to be you because who you are is good. God only made one of you, and you're going to try to change that? Try to make it be like somebody else? Isn't that silly? Yet we do it all the time. And it's just because we don't believe what God has said about us. We don't believe who we already are. But as we let the truth of what God says about us rise up and go into our heart continually, let God bring it up over and over and over, chew on it, the fullness of God's life, is going to begin to flow through you effortlessly. The words that God says about you will consume the lies and burn out the lies so that all that will be left in you is the fullness of God, which is what he's had for you all along. We were created for that fullness, and we have that fullness. It's already a done deal. It's just the lies that prevent us from living in it. So, Father, I just thank you so much for what you say about me and every person that you have ever created. Who we are is good. It always was good. It is good now and always will be good. There is nothing that we can do to change that. I thank you, Lord, for continuing to persuade our hearts of that truth. Persuade us continually, Lord, until all the lies are gone and we can have your fullness flowing out of us effortlessly and we can know the length and the depth and the height and the breadth of your love for us. Amen. I knew it would be, yes. <laughs>
And here's how it goes. Jay and I took a little trip for the last three days. And um, while we were away, we, were, we had the opportunity, opportunity to swim in a really nice pool and to float around in a really nice little lazy river. And it was just a really nice little getaway. And um, I was raised that it was really very important um, to think about what would others say about me? What would others think about me? This was ingrained in me all of my life. And I've struggled for many, many years to, you know, always worrying about what would others think? What if my hair isn't combed just right? What if my makeup isn't on just right? What if um, my clothes don't match? Well, what happened um, when we were, I was packing my bag to drive over to the pool. Put my arm around my friend. And um, as I was changing my clothes, to go in the lazy river and have some nice enjoyable time with my husband, all of a sudden I noticed that when I grabbed my bathing suit top and my bathing suit bottom, it didn't match because I had brought two different bathing suits with me. So it's like, oh my gosh, I started to panic <laughs> because there are a lot of people at the pool. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to get dressed, I'm going to have to get in the car, I'm going to have to drive back to the campsite, I'm going to have to get the suit that matches. And as I was starting to panic, it was like the Lord said, it's okay. You can put on a bathing suit top and a bathing suit bottom that doesn't match, and you can go out there and you can just be yourself, because who you are is good, and what other people think about whether or not your bathing suit matches or doesn't match <laughs> doesn't really matter. And at that very moment, it was like, oh my gosh, I had that freedom to be able to just enjoy that time with my husband and for the first time in my life to be able to recognize the fact that yes, my clothes don't match. And yes, people might judge me. They might point their finger at me. Probably not. But the, the bottom line was it didn't matter anymore. Because I know that who I am is good. Um, I know that I am crucified with Christ, meaning um, what other people think doesn't really matter. Only what he thinks about me matters. So I was able to really have fun in that lazy river with my husband in a bathing suit top and bottom that didn't match. <laughs> That's and it, freedom. It brought me freedom. That's what I was going to say. And it brought me freedom. So I just wanted to share that with you all. So go out today and let God show you that you can be free to be yourself. Just relax and rest and enjoy who you are. Amen.